Oh, okay, so um uh Uh, so um, it, I, I do want to make clear it wasn't the store owners; it was the guys coming to the store who were also Arabs. You know, they had asked he had asked me a question, and you know, like he, somehow, like he guessed I was Jewish. He's like, "Are you Jewish?" And I said, "Yeah." And then they pretty much beat me up. But the week before was the exact opposite. Details. What did they the do week... to you? What did they do to you? Well, they, they 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 tried to beat me up. Like 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 it was like I mean they didn't get very far because what the store did they manager do? did they use their fists or their no, no, they just tried to take me by the shirt, and the one guy tried to raise his fist, and then the store guy, he was also Arab, says, hey, you can't do that on my, you can't do that near my store. He said, you guys have to go. Very nice. Um, yeah, the week, the week before, it was kind of the opposite thing. It's, you know, these people were like, you know, like found out I was Jewish, and they, they were not Arab at all, and they were like, you know, I just want you no, to know no, that. Well, when they were talking about, you know, the first incident, you know, we haven't finished. So they oh, thought okay. that you were a Zionist because you said you were Jewish? Is that what this was? I, I think that's what it was. I think that they didn't like. I, I think that they didn't distinguish. I think the store manager did because most of the store managers that are Arab, they know this stuff already because they have a lot of Jewish customers and a lot did of the you, Jewish customers. Did you like, did you explain uh, your condition to them? Uh, to to the guys that were trying to beat me up, uh, I, yeah. I didn't get a word. Edge wise, the guy had kicked them out before they could really get that far. Okay. Uh huh. But it, yeah, it was. You have it was, to. You, you know, like you have to. You know, like be very quick. <laughs> Whoa. See, I do do that, but it gets the problem is socially, it, you know, it gets awkward and redundant to certain people who already know these things. And like usually the store managers, they know these things typically. Yeah. You know, um, they usually know they're in the know about that stuff. Like these were random. Uh, these, these these Arab guys were random, not the store owner who also is Arab. He already knew all this. In fact, well, I don't think he knew me. He knows about those things. He typically doesn't just, you know, because that's that's kind of how the culture is out here that, the, you know, what, you know. Um, which is why I don't like to talk about it to white people because Arab petty bourgeois people are usually very educated about the difference between Jewish and Zionist, hmm. you know, and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, think about the class. I, I know that this is something you're not supposed to do according to communists, but I don't typically think about it, it, it as a caste, as a class thing. I think of everything as caste, you know, so like, yes, you know, there are differences in privilege, but like, I think what really sets it off in a, in a settler colonial country <laughs> like the United States is, more your nationality is what constitutes, forgive me, the class a lot of times, particularly at, like out here. Okay. But, you know, like we've been working a long time, you know, to uh, to educate, you know, the Arab and Palestinian population. That's the difference, you know, between Jewish and Zionist. And the uh, all the Arab Palestinian uh, tendencies, you know, have adopted, you know, the distinction between being Jewish and being a Zionist. I would Hamas agree. actually changed this whole charter dropped its 1988 charter, adopted a new charter, which only critiqued Zionism in the charter of 2017. But the Zionists that I meet, you know, on the vigil, you know, in the Jewish community on Sunday every week, they don't know this. They're only told about the charter of 1988, which talks about the Jewish people being the source of the problem, and which refers to the protocols of the elders of Zion, even, you know, like it was an anti-Semitic document. And they still believe that Hamas is into that even though Hamas quit the Muslim Brotherhood, dropped his charter. And I don't think that they, you know, targeted civilians during the October the 7th, you know, military operation. They were there in order to take hostages. And they got rid of an awful lot of soldiers who a couple of years before were the ones who were the snipers who killed 363 peaceful Palestinian protesters on the, on the Great March of Return, you know, to the, to the frontier there, who were unarmed and shot down. And those were yeah, the they're, they're, who were doing it. So yeah, there, there, there is actually no to this day no proof that any civilians were taken. Is it like alright if I call you right back? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can jump in anytime. I need to charge my phone for a minute. Okay. Okay. We'll be on um, for another thirty minutes. Um, the, um, the, I've been hearing, I, I kept hearing like from like, I, I, I try not to, to watch the corporate media, but whenever I tune in the corporate media, there is the maintaining that at least since I last heard it, that, you know, they, 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 they came after babies and stuff to, you know, and, you know, and, and whatever, but I've never seen any footage of babies being taken by Hamas. I've done uh, two videos, you know, which goes to the, uh, uh, you know, the Zionist, you know, website set up, you know, supposedly to, to present, you know, the evidence, you know, of these charges of the of horrors, horror, horrible atrocities. So I went to the 
to the two websites that I was referred to by a Zionist, you know, came to me, you know, during the vigil at the Jewish community campus here in Montreal. Uh -huh. One of them, you know, like had a list of all the horrible atrocities and you're supposed to click on it, you know, to see the videos of the atrocity. But when you click on it, there were no videos, none at all. So I did one video, you know, to demonstrate that uh -huh. and recorded, you know, the, uh, the screen, you know, as I was trying to find the videos. And then that was not the one that's called, you know, like Hamas, HamasMassacre.com. And another one that I was referred to called Hamas.com. I went to that and they had videos. They had all the charges, you know, of all the crimes, you know, the horror stories. And then, you know, I went into each of them, you know, and there were some videos there, but they were not about, you know, what the title was. There was no videos of, you know, 40 beheaded, you know, burnt babies. There was no yeah, mass rapes. <laughs> There's uh uh, uh, you know, like then there was nothing, you know, the, you know, the videos that they showed were only the body cams, you know, that the mass fighters themselves, you know, had recorded and were later killed and their body cams recuperated by the, uh, by the uh, Zionist military. And they took these videos from the mass fighters and they put them on the website. And what they showed was the mass fighters, soldiers taking hostages, not killing people, but taking hostages. And in a somewhat, you know, rough way, but not even brutal, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, like it proved the opposite of what they were contending. No. Yeah, I would figure so, because I've seen, I've seen all, I've seen a lot of footage of after October the uh, 7th of, you know, um, the IDF attacking. I'm having, I'm having, somebody's knocking on the door. And if that happens, if, 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 if it continues, I'm going to have to cut this short. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. You know, uh, I'll make some comments and then come back, you know, to see. So you can see who it is, okay. if okay. it's urgent. Okay. So I made the second video of the other website, the Zionist website, which um, serves to uh, prove that there is no proof as to the allegations made of the uh, uh, atrocities supposedly committed by Hamas on October the 7th, because there weren't atrocities. The atrocities that were committed were committed by the Zionist military. One, in terms of tank fire that killed hostages together with the Hamas uh, fighters in the uh, kibbutzim, Gibbets Berry in particular, which there is direct testimony. And uh, also the uh, videos from the uh, Zionist military, which show the uh, Apache helicopters uh, targeting uh, vehicles that were fleeing from the Nova Festival site. Some were fleeing towards Gaza, which is presumed, you know, to have uh, hostages and fighters together. They were destroyed. And uh, the others uh, were just, you know, uh, festival goers who were fleeing and were uh, held in, in in place, you know, by the border police, you know, who wouldn't let them get out. And they were uh, destroyed as well by the Apache Hell, Hellfire missiles, which were targeting them as well, even though they were trying to escape from the battle area. Initially- I just, wanted, I just want to make sure you couldn't see my daughter in the frame, could you? No, just something on the wall there. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, because the- it's it's really chaos, and I'm I'm trying. I have like I said, I have this to do list and everything. But uh, but back on the topic, I have seen I have seen a lot of footage of the IDF bombarding the Palestinians since after October seventh. I've not seen like actual civilian attacks of um, Hamas taking you know like like the, the the horrendous stuff. Like I know that they took hostages. That's all I know. Yeah, you know, like and, they, as I, think, I was saying, you know. The uh, body cam uh, videos that are shown by the Zionist military that were taken from the Zionist fighters who were killed uh, only show them, you know, taking hostages, not killing civilians. That was not their objective. That's not what they had done. Unless, you know, uh, there was a civilian or a reserve officer, as they're called, who took up a gun, you know, and started shooting at them. Then they got shot back, of course. But otherwise, there was no intention, you know, to massacre or carry out a genocide or mass rape, you know, all the Israeli women as if, you know, this is what, you know, Arabs are supposed to be doing if they get their freedom. Which this is, may be uh, a bit, this may be a bit radical, but I'm so tired of hearing about terrorism. I want the word deodorized because, because why is fascism a deodorized word, but, but we're, 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 we're injecting steroids into the word terrorism. I don't agree with, you know me, I, I think the terrorist tactic has always been stupid, but it's an underdog tactic. The idea that the terrorists are going to take away everything or they're going to hurt your children. It's, it's, it's so fantastically absurd to me because, mm. you know, that's all, you know, yeah, it's a cliche, but it's a true cliche. Uh, uh, terrorism is what the big army calls the little army, you know, mm. 
Mm -hmm. They call them terrorists. Mm -hmm. The scary thing, and this is actually one of the problems in Arizona, is the word fascist is very not scary to a lot of people out here. Like it's deodorized. And yet there's a lot of fascists out here, but that may have something to do with it. You know, I mean, along, among a lot of the LGBTQ plus in Arizona, they are afraid of the word fascist, like for obvious reasons. But like, um, you know, why is the word fascist deodorized? But the word terrorist is not. It's it like the terrorist is is overemphasized when it's, it's like ridiculous. The, you know, what I mean, like terrorism yeah. isn't the threat. Let me tell you, my mother's brother, who was a partisan, and initially mm -hmm. set up an underground railway to get the women out of the Warsaw ghetto to save the nation. Yeah, He was a, par a, a partisan who fought when the Nazis invaded the USSR, was later, you know, uh, conscripted into the Red Army and was lost there. Okay. He was initially called a terrorist by the Nazis. That's what they called the terrorists, the partisans who were fighting back against the occupation of the Eastern European territories. So, you know, like terrorist means a freedom fighter as far as I'm concerned. See, and, and, uh, um, that's why on the Bundist movement uh, channel, um, uh, which I need some, which I may need some help, you know, doing more with the channel. I might need some extra participation for that particular channel soon. Um, I, I, I said on that channel, um, I forget which video it is because I've made quite a few videos in the last months or so for, for, for you know, because I'm trying to provide something before I give the big project I want to give to that channel. Uh, I said in one of the videos, I, maybe more than one of them, but I said that... Uh, you know, we need to be as partisans willing to fight the Zionists physically if it comes down to that, because this is a genocide. We may have to actually defend the Palestinians physically. And, you That's know, that's what are... I said in my last video, you know, uh, two I... weeks ago, actually, when I was on the vigil and this and the Christian woman who came up, you know, and, and started shouting at me while I was talking with somebody, you know, and then. I told her that, you know, that she should just go away, you know, because she was, you know, hysterical. And that's when uh -huh. she attacked the banner. And then I got angry, you know, and then I came, you know, I have these bamboo poles, you know, holding up the banner. Yeah. You know, they're <laughs> solid, you know. So then I came at her, you know, with the bamboo stick and she ran away, you know, and I said, I'll fight anybody who tries to attack this banner. Imagine, I'm yes, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I agree. Andrew. I'm actually buying what's called a trench knife. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, yeah, that's uh, that will impress uh, anybody who tries to attack you for sure. <laughs> and then we'll think about it again. Because yeah. I think that, you know, like that we're victims, you know, we're supposed to act like victims. You were supposed to be afraid. We're not supposed to fight back, you know, and we're not supposed to win, you know. <laughs> and that's what the Zionists, you know, like are trying to uh, build up the pride of Jewish people, you know, to make them think that uh, we're invincible now and that we can fight off any sort of, you know, uh, forces that come to attack the Jewish people. But instead, they're using that force, you know, to attack rather than defend. And yet they're still into it. You know, it's incredible. Jew Jewish Antifa wa was actually uh, Antifa was an actual real partisan. Like I, I like I, this is one of the reasons why I think that the Boone's history is often f deliberately forgotten is because it ties directly into the Antifa, the Antifa of Germany, the Antifa of, 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 of uh, Italy and the Antifa in Poland was majority Boondist, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and they, they all they were all connected like there was there was, yes, the Marxist Leninists of Germany. They were very radical, actually, um, that the anti-fascist action. But you also but they were in contact with the ones in Italy and they were all in contact with the stuff in Warsaw, which was all Bundist. Hmm. So I think hmm. that that's the funny thing is, you know, Antifa is being demonized because they don't want you to remember that Zionism had nothing to do with Antifa. Nothing. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, we didn't. They, they, we had. We had uh, uh, the Bundists. We had. We actually, if anything, were actually um, on par with anarchists and Marxists. If anything, like we had our sectarian problems with them, but we had way more of a connection to them than we did the freaking Zionists. That's history. Yeah. Like, like that and also, in history. 1905 revolution, the Bund was in the United Front with all the other revolutionary tendencies. Yeah. And. Uh, and they were the heroes of the 1905 revolution. They're the ones who fought off, you know, the police and the military for a while. And, see, and that's the thing is, is we're, we're getting back to that with like with with, you know, people of color wanting Maoism over just Marxism, Leninism. And, you know, not, not that Marxism, Leninists, that are principled can't be involved, but like it's Maoists that are relooking into Antifa, I've noticed, like mm -hmm. Irish Maoists, Black Maoists, um, anarchists very are, are very good at Antifa. Hmm. But but, um, but but like the, the the police, the ghetto police, the the, the you know the Jew the the Jewish people that were uh like I don't know like 
acting as middle management for the Nazis, you know, they were majority Zionists. And that's that's actually on record. Like we, you, I don't know where to find the records, but I used to see certain records like information, you know, um, back in the twenty tens when there was what? more stuff. The Zionists the majority, were a majority of what? Uh, the ghetto police that okay, yeah, so yeah, there were the, the capos. The capos yes, were yes. 70, 70. 1 percent, you know, Zionists. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And see, that's that's the other half part of this is that not only was the majority of partisans Bundists. You know, and and, and when not Bundist, it, like when not Bundist, the Jewish partisans uh, would have been Marxist or anarchists. And, you know, if anything, you know, like they, they, Zionists later came way too late into the partisan movement and not enough of them. And when you look at the like, I don't know how many of the Kappas were, were, were Zionists, but I'm pretty sure it was a majority. I don't know the exact number, but that was. Actually, I just told you the 70.1 percent because I yeah, read okay, it. All right. So that's Hello, the big thing. I, what's that? I think that this. No, Andrew, what's that? What about Abba Kovner? Oh, yeah, it sounds familiar, but I, I don't remember what the story is about. You, you led this movement called Nakam, actually, and he killed about 600 SS prisoners of war. He yeah, killed them as, as prisoners of war after the, after the war or, or what, during the war? Afterwards, and he actually went on to form Israel. So he was a Zionist partisan. Who? Oh, so after the war, the Zionists took revenge. Yes, but not during the war. They weren't partisans unless they were mm -hmm. caught and they had no other choice. Yeah, no, in the Warsaw Ghetto, mm -hmm. there were two Zionist factions that that fought uh, together with the Bund. Yeah. This is what I mean by a cover up on Antifa's history. It's not that it's not known. It's no there. Nobody want like nobody in the establishment wants younger people to know this because younger people are interested in these factors, mm. you know, and what that shows is who was in Antifa, the Boont, who was in the Kappa, Zionists. Like My ancestors said, were actually labor activists and before they had to leave in 1905 during a pogrom. Your parents, you mean? Uh, your grandparents, you mean? My great, great grandparents by now. Ah, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, you're young. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. Yeah. yeah. Oh my. Well, um, these pilgrims I'm talking about were uh, pilgrims in the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. Is that a? I, I like the flag in in your uh, on your wall behind you, but it, it looks like a the Russian eagle, double headed eagle with a with a communist star on a red background. It's, it's like Albania. A, it's the People's Socialist Republic of Albania. Oh, and here's the Palestinian flag. Yes. I have a small Palestinian flag. It's it's not very impressive. Um, I mean, I guess Albania I could show you. is Muslim, of course. Albania is uh, one of the two countries in Europe that actually helped the Jewish uh, people escape, you know, from the Nazis' uh, Holocaust. The, uh, Albania and uh, Denmark, and all the rest. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. All the rest, you know, like the best uh, was. Uh, let's say France, in which 40% of the Jewish population was, was killed off. Uh, Holland, about the same thing, or maybe 50%. Of course, this is the in, best I got. This wasn't yes. very impressive. It looked a lot bigger when I ordered it when I, online. It's not very impressive. And I'm talking about the percentage of uh, Holocaust victims in each of the European countries, in contrast to Albania and Denmark, in which the Jewish people were saved. But the other countries, you know, the, the percentage of Jewish people who were lost was between 40% and 90%, as in Poland, like my family. What about Belarus? Belarus, I think, was about the same as the other countries there. Eastern Europe you know, was, um, is like a very high percentage you know, that were lost. You, you know, a really good argument for the civil society over this state is Denmark, I think, because Denmark had been occupied and a lot of the people in Denmark didn't want to hand over Jewish people. Yeah. You know, because they, they they had gotten so close because they lived door by door with each other. So, like, 
um, that's one of the reasons why I'm just not interested in talking about campaigns because like a lot of people out here are very, very, uh, who are radical and who, who, um, don't like what's going on in Palestine. They, 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 they don't care to get into the politics because, you know, the, they're, there's the people, but if the people have no representation by the government, you know, the civil society does start to self-manage. Manage. It's starting to do that in the West Coast and certain pockets in the Southwest out here. Like it's it's starting to happen. And a lot of times you'll see um, that, you know, uh, uh, Arabs are organizing around this. And they, they're, they're, there's a whole campaign to dump Biden out here right now, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, like you ask them who you're voting for, they say we're not voting. Like vote, vote to sabotage, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, and I said they found this too scary to say. I'll say it, but they, they're too scared to say it. And I understand why, because they'll be targeted quicker than I will if they say it. And I said, well, you know, we need to make a new slogan. Make treason popular again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, there was a, a lingering thought that I had uh, in, in the previous discussion. And uh, that was, yes, okay, so the European countries are generally uh, anti-Semitic and allowed the Holocaust to proceed. But in the uh, Arab-controlled countries, there was no Holocaust, even though they were occupied by the Nazis even, right? Morocco, right, yeah. Tunisia, Libya was occupied, Egypt was occupied, but the Jewish people were protected. Yeah, in fact, in fact, they also hid Jewish people. And in fact, there's proof that Palestinians hid Jewish people. There's proof, actually. Even um, the Ottoman Empire and Palestine Jews were treated equally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the Jews were given a certain autonomy, but it had both disadvantages and advantages. Okay? So they had to pay a tax special for the protection of the state, which may or may not have been forthcoming in certain instances. And two, they were banned, you know, from uh, being uh, being conscripted into the military. So they didn't have any military training. And so they were defenseless as a result. That was the problem with the Dimi status under the Ottoman Empire. And it seems to me, you know, like a lot of the proponents, you know, of the one-state group think that this is what's going to happen again in, one, in a one-state, you know, solution. You know, they have no idea what they're talking about. They have a really sort of you know primitive you know view of constitutional politics. They don't know what uh, you know one state means. You know, like imagine if there was a one state. You know, like as the slogan goes, you know, like one Palestine, you know, from the river to the sea. You know, then how does it decide you know what to do with the Palestinian refugees who are waiting to come back on the right of return? Okay, let's say there's going to be a vote. So how do they decide it? You know, when the population is 50-50? and if one side, you know has a little bit, you know, more of a majority and they decide, you know, uh, they're on the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. Or if the other side has a a slim majority and they decide not to allow the right of return of the Palestinians. (laughs) How is it going to be resolved? It won't be resolved. It'll just result in a civil war. One state solution is not a solution. Neither is a two state solution. That's the two-state would... solution, the, the, the two state solution is one of the da- most dangerous things to however ever push because I, I I I know that this is not said a lot, but if you think about it, we already see what a two state we already have the two state solution. That's kind of the issue right here is like there because Palestine's already recognized and it has no power. It has no, to it's see not at the UN. recognized. It's not recognized. Uh, Israel hasn't was rec- recognized Palestine yet. And the UN has not recognized Palestine as a voting member of the United Nations. It's only yeah, recognized as an observer state in the General Assembly. But that's going to change now. Wow. You know, Palestine is going to be admitted to the General Assembly, and Israel may be suspended from the General Assembly. And then they'll vote for sanctions, etc. But 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 isn't the United States still going to veto it? Because like even okay, like uh, and, and I think, General Assembly, think General Assembly, they don't have a, right, they don't have a veto in the General Assembly. And anything that's voted, you know, by two thirds absolute majority, you know, is uh, more powerful than a veto. Okay, but th- but thank you for clarifying that because, like, uh, uh, there was that thing that the state had been, the state of Palestine had been recognized, but you know, like the UN is so complicated. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think the uh, UN Security Council should be uh, abolished. Actually, um, if, yeah, if we're talking probably. about the five countries, yeah, there's a big reform movement now. You know, by the third world, you know, want to change the United Nations. But um, um, 
there is a provision for overruling a veto in the Security Council by the by the, uh, the General Assembly, in which uh, two thirds of the uh, delegates, you know, would vote an absolute uh, uh, supermajority, as it's called, uh, including and that uh, uh, that accounting includes, you know, the abstentions. So the abstentions would count as a vote against a two thirds absolute majority. But I think Palestine could get that. And they could overrule the veto in the Security Council as a result. This was a provision in the United States, you know, built into the uh, Charter of the United Nations because they wanted to be able to overrule any uh, any Soviet veto, but it's never been used, and now it can be used against the U.S. veto. That's very interesting. You know a lot about the 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 the, 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 the inner bureaucracy of a lot of this. I've always found all that confusing, because like. If if we like, if you think about the the auto determination of, of people's, you know, like they, they, this this this, there's there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, red tape that you know nobody wants to see anymore. But like they, they always say, the toothless UN. But the concept behind what the UN represents is a good idea, you know. And and there are you know like proposals even to the to 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 um a, an alternative to the United Nations. But like within the United Nations itself, there does seem to be more radicals trying to get in there. I just yeah. I don't I don't know how the process works, but like. Um, well, the Third World Revolution has taken over the United Nations General Assembly. Yeah. You know, since the United Nations was set up and all the colonies became independent and became affiliated under the pressure of the USSR, and all of a sudden they had a majority. You know, like, and that's why, you know, the Security Council, you know, the United States wants to keep its veto there because they're afraid of the Third World and the General Assembly. But I think the that the, I think of that the United murder... Nations is faulty in the first place because it's based upon the recognition of nation states. Yes. And, and this is false because if you look at the number of nations actually that exist in the world's people's cultures, you have 3,000 3, you know, nations in the world. But and some cultures- 194 nation states. Some cultures are tied up with the land and some cultures are organically um, nomadic too. And this is, this is never put into the consideration um, with, with, you know, um, you know, like the, like, you, you can always tell when people keep calling every country in the world a nation, like people still say that in America, but America cannot by definition be a nation at all. That's not possible. No, it's it, a state. You know, like, yeah, yeah it's and a, uh, one of the things- It's a confederation, I, basically. It's a confederation of states. Yeah. Yes. And not so, even of nations, like when you think about it, because nations don't have actual autonomy within those states. That's right. Yeah, like the black nation, for instance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But- uh, with 3,000 nations in the world, you know, substantial nations, and only 194 nation states recognized in the General Assembly, there has got to be a big change. There's got to be some sort of means of, you know, representation for all the nations that represent civil society and not the state itself. The state is bourgeois. So the United Nations is bourgeois. The, the, um, the uh, like it was... Like it was with certain uh, people within Amsterdam, you know, like the ones that you know um, helped Anne Frank's family. I, I don't remember the, the name of this, the, the 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 Anne Frank's father, but like there's a series called I think it's called A Small Light on you know on, on National Geographic. It's actually a, a movie series, like it's a, like it's I I don't know if it's a ten part series or what, but it has to do with uh, Anne Frank's father and the two partisan the partisan couple that took over the store when you know he had supposedly disappeared. What he, he didn't really disappear. Uh, but like these, the, we're seeing replications of that and to a certain extent, like not not like exactly like that, where you have to be afraid all oh, your friends are going to be taken away right right away. But there is a concern by um, a lot of Arabs who are making, who are, who are drawing parallels to the Holocaust and what's happening, in, you know, with the war on Gaza. And I'm of the same mentality of that. I think that we should like be, be, be prepared for it because uh, Trump was openly talking about stopping like the, uh, like he was he was saying openly racist stuff like more, more than he had before when he was president. You know, he 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 has spoken in terms of trying to wipe out Palestine and he's spoken in terms of, you know, not uh, of ending mixed racing and stuff. And um, Biden, I don't think Biden's going to get a second term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and my, my analysis of it is that. The establishment wants to keep Biden, but nobody likes Biden, and they and Biden keeps doing. It seems to be kind of senile. He seems to be making way too many Floridian slips, and they don't trust Trump. 
but Trump will probably get it, even if he's in prison. Like, in fact, if Trump went to prison, I'll tell you what the culture of like of white supremacy is in the United States today. If Trump was to go to prison, that would boost his credibility to the Republicans. Hmm. So he well, could he, actually he, he could be actually be president uh, before from prison. the election. You know, the, his, his uh, judicial process is uh, supposed to come to a decision uh, at a later time in which he would presumably, you know, already have been elected. So he's he's calling for the recognition of immunity, impunity, immunity and impunity for the president, as if the president were a king. And this is before the Supreme Court right now. <laughs> you know, it's funny because ever but since ever since the Patriot Act, we don't have Act, much time. You know, we only have a few minutes. You know, so okay. let's each take a minute to conclude. Okay, Net, go. You've got a minute. Well, I have to say good, good Shabbos and Shabbat Shalom because I because I'm gonna have, because I'm gonna have to prepare for the Sabbath, but um. I, I'm. I really think we need to just stop being scared because there's so many of us of different backgrounds, uh, uh, Machica and, and and mestizo Mexicans and uh, and uh, black people and Arabs. So like Jewish partisans, we can like there are a lot of these places we can openly talk about being partisans and nobody does anything because they're all of the same mindset because we already know that fascism is here. We're not sure exactly what form it's going to take right now, but it's already here. And, you know, like we need to openly talk about uh, uh, being partisans and taking up arms to protect Palestinians, you know, and I, I thought of having a Jewish migration all the way to, to, to Lebanon to become Lebanese citizens. And like, I don't know, aid Hezbollah. I've, yes, I've even thought in those terms, because like contrary to popular belief, Hezbollah doesn't hate Jewish people at all. They never have. Yeah, actually. I thought of a place to move as well. OK, Andrew, what is your what are your concluding remarks for this uh, yeah. recording? Shabbat Koiru and Ocha and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Get Shabbos, as we say in Yiddish. And other than that, thank mm -hmm. you. Other mm -hmm. than that, I'd like to say there's this oblast, so to speak, this region in Russia called the Birbijan. Jewish, the Jewish. Oh, Autonomous Oblast. Oblast. Yes, Oblast. this is where we want to put the Jewish International Bund, actually. Well, you do. <laughs> I don't think it can work. Uh, well, a lot of people, it's, 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 it's been thought of by a lot of people. You know, it's not just me. I just I just happen to be one of the ones that's stubborn enough to keep with the idea. Uh, I, I think it, it Upper be State something... New York is better <laughs> as a territorial base. In Baltimore... You're... <laughs> but the, I can see I'd why like you say conclude, that. But... You know, like I would like to conclude myself and okay. mention that the veterans of the Palestinian Solidarity Movement have now the responsibility to educate those who are coming to an appreciation of the Palestinian resistance as a resistance movement and not a terrorist movement, and educate them to know that the Jewish people are not with Zionism. The majority of the Jewish people have chosen not to live in Israel, are de facto non-Zionists, and there's more Jewish Americans than there are Jewish Israelis, and that they should be educated to the effect that the Jewish people have to become an ally of the Palestinians and are not a de facto enemy of the Palestinians. It is the Zionists who have been indoctrinated to be enemies of the Palestinian people, and even they can be educated by other Jewish people, not non-Jewish people, but by other Jewish people as to what is actually going on and what is happening against their own interests and being sent you know, to sacrifice their children for nothing. So we've got a big job ahead of us and uh, we're ready. We're, we're, getting, we're getting organized now. And I continue with my vigil on Sunday here and I'll record that whole thing and show you. I have a number of interactions with the Zionists who come to debate and shout at me and I, and I argue with them and I show you, and that demonstrates you know, the way in which one can argue with the Zionists effectively. Israel. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. The state is not Israel. We the are is not Israel. Israel. My father even told me that the name of my tribe, our tribe is Israel, you know, because it is the name of the Jewish people other than the Kohanim and the Levi, you know, but altogether, we are the Jewish people. We are the Jewish people. The state is not Israel. That's right. Great. Thank you, comrades. Good night. Thank you. Good Shabbos.